21. Revelation chapter 21 as we continue on with what we've been looking at. We stopped in verse 8 of chapter 21 last time. So let's take it off in verse number 19 as we see some spectacular sights is what I titled this. Spectacular sights. Beginning in verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was likened to a stone more precious even a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal, hence four square. And he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of man that is of the angels. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. The city was pure gold, likened to crystal glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardox, the seventh sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophasis, chrysophrasis, and the eleventh a jessethin, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls every several gate of one pearl. And notice, and the street, not streets, but the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light thereof. Now notice that, shall walk, didn't say to live, but walk. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there should be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written and the Lamb's book of life. And Father, we ask tonight that you would do what we're unable to do, and that is to open the scriptures. We can teach them, we can preach them, but unless the Holy Spirit brings illumination and brings out the truths of your word, um, Nothing will happen tonight. So Lord, we do pray that you help us as we see this spectacular sight and the glory of our heavenly home. And Lord, we pray that this day in May might challenge our hearts and Lord, cause us to keep on keeping on as we look forward to what the future holds for thy children. Bless now the preaching and teaching of thy word, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So thinking and, of course, reading and praying and looking over these scriptures, we're mindful of how this all began. John, of course, the youngest of the disciples who would write five books of the Bible. He would die of old age. He would be exiled, and that's where he has the first vision in chapter number one, the vision of the Lord. And as the Bible tells us that John was to write the things which he saw, the things which were, and of course the things which were or are, were the time of the seven churches, chapter two and chapter three. And then the things which should be hereafter. And then chapter four and five, you remember the sealed book. The sealed book, of course, only one could open the book. And of course, rightfully so, the Lamb of God could open the book because the book is about him. And then we began to see a series of seven, seven seals. Those seven seals, of course, spoke to us about the ruining of the earth by mankind. Following the seven seals were seven trumpets. The seven trumpets were, of course, the ruling of Satan, who, of course, wants rule of the earth. And then the finality, of course, and in between the finality of the seven last plagues was seven personages that we saw. And then, of course, the seven vials was the Lord rescuing. And then in chapter 19 and chapter 20, we saw the bride and chapter 19, the lamb's wife. And then chapter 20, of course, remember the battle of Armageddon, chapter 19, and then chapter 20, Satan sealing for a thousand years as the millennium reign began. And then after that thousand years, Satan was loosed, went deceived the nations upon the earth. Then finally in verse 10, he was cast alive in the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and he is no more. And then chapter 21 and chapter 22, the concluding chapters of the book of the Revelation, of course, we saw that in verse five, that God makes everything new. Verse number eight, we left off last time, and that, of course, was the eight uh, different uh, personages and uh, their sins and their abomination and of course, beginning with the unbelievers and uh, in verse number eight. So verse number nine then, John sees this spectacular, spectacular sight. He is encouraged to come three times. The word come is found in this chapter, chapter four, and then in chapter number 17. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. So this was one of the angels that, of course, were delivering the seven vials, which was God's wrath and judgment, and uh, said, Come hither, uh, th hither I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And John is carried up into a mountaintop and sees a spectacular sight. Now just think about that. I mean, what is heaven going to be like? I mean, we've seen some sights, and you've seen some beautiful sights, and You've seen some great architectural design and some great engineering and some great feats and some great uh, sights you and I have seen, but nothing to compare with this. When I think of the Apostle Paul who was stoned and left for dead at Lystra, uh, he actually died. And in that time, he was carried into heaven. And the Bible says that 14 years later, he waited 14 years to describe the sight. And he said the sight was unspeakable. He couldn't, couldn't mention it, couldn't even begin to explain it. And so God gave him that sight, of course, to keep him keeping on for the Lord. Now here John, exiled on the island of Patmos, and you can imagine how discouraged he must have been in a penal colony. And so the Lord has given him all these visions and John is seeing all this. And then finally, finally, I guess the capsule, the, the, the time of this great splendor that uh, this angel takes up John and the spirit and they go on this high mountain and uh, the angel says, I want you to look. John couldn't even describe it and put it into words. I mean, how glorious. Uh, you ladies who wear diamonds 
or different rubies or sapphires or rings that go along with your birth dates and so forth. And uh, so this city is going to be so spectacular. And we can think, of course, the moon uh, is reflects from the sun. But this city, the light will be within and shining out. And uh, so how spectacular it's going to be, this holy site, the holy Jerusalem. Now, we need to understand uh, there is a earthly Jerusalem and there is a heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem, of course, will be this city that comes down from heaven and uh, begins to uh, hover over the earth. It'll be our home. It'll be our eternal home. By the way, we'll live there during the millennium. We who the church. Now, we see in the end of the chapter, there are three groups, the Jews and then the Gentile nations, but we're the bride. So the new Jerusalem is all about the bride. Uh, this commentary says this, uh, figurative, this commentary says that, but uh, it's going to be a, a celestial city that will hover. Now, years ago, you couldn't even imagine that, but now, of course, there are space stations that are hovering and, uh, and been hovering for a very long time. And verse number 11 tells us the glory of the Lord is there and the glory of God. And uh, so let's just finish verse 10. So this holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious. So of course this brightness uh, this brightness, of course, is the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Father. And, of course, our eternal home. Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. By the way, John wrote the Gospel of John. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so out of told you, I go and prepare a place for you. So heaven's a prepared place for those who prepare themselves to receive him as their savior. And so it's a beautiful prepared place that our Lord has been working on for 2,000 years. So how magnificent is it going to be? I mean, the splendor of it and the glory of it. Sometimes people say, what's this Christianity all cracked up to be? And is it all that it's cracked up to be? It's even more. Uh, it's even more. Uh, Paul said, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Uh, so it, even describing this picture, uh, John is just aghast. And then there's a series of 12s and had a wall. Now, why the wall? The wall not for defense, of course, but the wall giving an idea of protection. And if you think about the city, there are pearls there. And we think, of course, of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, the pearl of great price. Well, the pearl is not the Lord Jesus. The pearl is the church. And just remember, it's a great picture of, uh, of course, the man who sold all that he had and bought the pearl. So when we think of the splendor of the city, you have the 12 foundations of the tribes. Of course, there's the Jews. You have the 12 apostles. And we think about the apostles and the significance of them. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. We think about the apostles and uh, who they were and uh, what they were and how they, of course, served the Lord. Uh, they were the foundation. Jesus was the rock, but they were the foundation. He's the cornerstone. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. They were first. They were first to establish the churches. They were first to be martyrs. They were first to suffer for Christ. 
And I believe, as others, of course, commentaries that I've read, that Peter was in error when he chose Matthias in Acts chapter 1. Remember, the Holy Ghost wasn't yet given. And so Peter, of course, following the book of the Psalms that said, uh, let someone take over his bishopric, of course, because Judas, of course, had fallen. And uh, so now we need another apostle. So as far as Peter was concerned, uh, Peter impetuous, like sometimes we can be, and go ahead of the Lord and step ahead of the will of the Lord. And that's exactly what Peter did. But I believe that the apostle Paul is the 12th apostle. I believe that because Paul spoke of himself as being the apostle, not called of men, but called of God. And so Paul, when he speaks of himself, look at Ephesians chapter 1, just one of the many books of the Bible that Paul talks about. Paul, an apostle, apostle. Well, remember, an apostle is one who had to actually see the Lord Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, Paul had a meeting uh, and an audience with the Lord Jesus Christ. So an apostle had to be one who saw the Lord in his glory. And uh, so Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, notice what it says, by the will of God, not of man, but by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Look at the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul an apostle. Now notice the parenthesis, Galatians 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> Not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia. So Paul, of course, gives his greetings. And then, of course, look, if you will, in verse 10, for I do not pers persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify your brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the death, shed blood, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. That's the gospel. So earlier here in Galatians, Paul said, <laughs> uh, verse number seven, or verse six, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Well, there's only one gospel, the real gospel, the true gospel, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, let him go to hell. That's what Paul is saying. As we said, therefore, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now going back to verse number 12, and I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, after Paul's conversion, he spent three years on the backside of the desert uh, teaching and learning at the feet of Jesus. How precious. <laughs> Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, learning about Judaism. And then he, of course, sat at the feet of our blessed Lord, uh, learning <clears throat> about the Lord Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation, verse 13 times past, in the Jewish religion, how that thou may on measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jewish religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, this is so precious, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, his grace, to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Flesh and blood will get you in trouble. <laughs> flesh and blood will get you in trouble. You need to know the will of God by the word of God, and that God has called you. 
or God has put you in a position to do thus and so, and that's of the Lord. Because if you confer with man, they'll talk you out of things. And uh, so especially uh, men who are called to preach, sometimes their wives or sometimes their parents sent, not God sent. And, uh, but when God does it, of course, it'll be lasting. To reveal his son to me that I might preach him, verse 16, among the heathen, immediately conferred I not with flesh and blood, verse 17, neither went up to Jerusalem to them, which were apostles before me, but I went unto Arabia. So possibly three years or so, Paul sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, returning again on Jerusalem. Then after three years, so three years at least he spent with the Lord, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, both with him 15 days, but of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So again, the foundation, going back to chapter 21, Revelation, the foundation Verse 14 of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me and had a golden reed. It's about a 10 foot long reed as a measuring stick to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square. The length is as large as the breadth. So as long, as wide, and as high. And, and, with, with measure with the reed, 12,000 furlongs and the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof 140 and four cubits, not very high compared to 1,500 feet, according to the measure of a man, that is of the angel, so approximately 18 inches, depending on how big your arm is, from the tip of your finger, to your elbow, mine could be 16 to 17 inches. Yours might be 21, 22 inches. And the building of the wall was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, likened to clear grass. Now, he's going to, of course, begin to tell us and give us the description of the city. Look again at verse number 19. And we'll notice then the different colors. Jasper clear diamond uh, or diamond-like stone. So just get a picture of that. If you've ever seen a real diamond, and, uh, and when you look at a diamond, of course, it can cut glass. And if you look at the brilliance of the diamond, the clarity of it, and so when measuring the price of a diamond, it's the clarity, the color of it, and the brilliance of it. And of course, if you ever wonder why, why uh, jewelers take a glass and look at the diamond or the, or the ring, they, they can see the clarity in that. Uh, had a diamond ring years and years ago, and uh, inside of it, when you look inside, there was some coal inside of it, so it wasn't pure. And uh, so this first foundation then, of course, is a diamond. The second is a sapphire. Well, my daughter's birthday in September, and years ago for Christmas, Mrs. Glenn and I bought her a set of uh, a sapphire ring and a set of sapphire earrings. And of course, the blue, uh, sapphire, and then uh, chalcedony, and uh, of course that is blue with colored stripes, and then emerald. Emerald, of course, you know, is the color green. Uh, sardox, and uh, red with white stone. Sardis, fiery red stone. Chrysolite, of course, yellow gold stone. Beryl, green stone. And then topaz, again a yellow green greenish stone, uh, chrysophrasis, a blue green stone, jacinthine, a violet stone, and then of course amethyst is a pure stone. So if you look at the colors, now how did we describe color? There's three colors that you get all colors from it. What are they? Red, blue, and yellow. And of those colors, you can put other colors. I mean, if we think about the rainbow, and uh, of course, Fort McMurray, sometimes we have some beautiful double rainbows. And uh, you think of the beauty of the rainbow. Well, the rainbow was given to let people know there would, God would not destroy the earth with the flood anymore. So the brilliance of his city, I mean, if you could just, if we could just, and for our minds, no way we could comprehend it. But it's gonna be a glorious city. And of course, the Lord is going to be there. We're going to be there. And it's going to be glorious. And then we think about the pearl. 
Uh, we think about the 12 gates made of pearl. Well, how is a pearl made? A pearl is made through pain. That oyster secretes the pearl to cover up the pain. Well, of course, we're the pearl of great price, and every time we go in and out of the city, we'll remember our redemption. So everything about the city, the apostles, the Jews, the tribes, the coloring, and of course, we think of gold, we think of the tabernacle. Well, the tabernacle, of course, was all overlaid with gold, and so the glory of this gold is gonna be splendorous and it's just magnificent. I mean, you think about transparent gold. Uh, what a beautiful place it's gonna be. What a marvelous place it's gonna be. And those of us who are the church, we will make up the priesthood of the believer. We will, of course, be living there, living there, working at the earthly Jerusalem and living there. I mean, it's gonna be wonderful. I mean, Hollywood could not make a movie to describe the glory of our new home, our heavenly homes. And the 12 straight, and now think about the size. Now, is it is it big enough for, what is there, eight and a half billion people in the world right now? Is that what it is, about eight and a half billion? So 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide. So 1,500 miles long and wide, well, can you put enough people in there? Probably six or seven billion, maybe. But then it goes up 1,500 miles. I mean, just think of the splendor of this. And then how about it? Is it a cubic? That's what the tabernacle was, 10 by 10 by 10. The Holy of Holies was 10 by 10 by 10. And, uh, and will it be a pyramid? Uh, it was uh, Harry Ironside that it might be a, a pyramid. Now, interesting architect. We don't have any round buildings. I went to a round church years ago, and I preached in a round church. It was a funny acoustics, and it was actually a round domed church out in the middle of nowhere. And I remember getting there early Sunday morning. We were there before the pastor. In fact, he was out of town. I was there filling in for him. And there was a note on the pulpit, I remember, that said, give Brother Glennon $50. And so I put a three in front of it and uh, thought I would excite him about that. But I remember preaching. We preached the morning, then we preached the evening. And it, the acoustics were just, it was like strange. So not very many rounded buildings upon the earth. And uh, in fact, I think that's the only round church I've ever preached that. I preached in some square churches and some crazy churches, but that round church. So how many, how many of the, celestial bodies are square. How many of them are like a pyramid? So very possible, if you think of a, uh, let me find these notes where I did with them. If you think about the dimension, the moon is 2,160 miles wide. The 1,500 mile wide, long, and high home for us would be 8,164 miles in circumference. And the width would be 2,600 miles. Now, I got this from J. Vernon McGee. He's one of my favorite preachers. Not a Baptist, but that's okay. He won't only be Baptist in heaven. And uh, he said, very possible, you could put that, you could put that cubit inside of a sphere and they would hit all the ends. So the satellite then, of course, I mean, you don't see any square uh, planets, do you? And you don't see any planets that look uh, like a, a um, pyramid. So it really doesn't matter because the Lord will be there and we'll see how it works out. But when you think about that sphere and uh, the moon is round, uh, the sun is round, and uh, the constellations and so forth, the planets are round, and uh, interesting stuff going on in the States right now. I don't know if you, I don't listen to the news, but I'm hearing people tell me that uh, they're seeing UFOs, uh, unidentified flying objects. And uh, now if you think about that, just 
But just put your head around that for a moment. How far are the planets, the galaxies? So whatever that craft would be for them to come here, uh, it would take years and 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 years. So I believe a lot of that stuff is just demonic and demons, but uh, we will uh, be visited and we are visited from, from beings beyond our galaxy, they're angels, and they come and go. So certainly the demons come and go, but just interesting phenomena going on about these UFOs, unidentified objects. And of course, sci-fi takes away from God, doesn't it? Green people. And, uh, and, and they look so hideous. You know, you watch the Wi-Fi movies, they look so hideous and so scary. And uh, so, anyway, Jesus died on planet Earth. So I don't believe there's anything out there, but we'll find out because we'll be living out there. And we have our glorified bodies. We won't need spacecrafts. And all the billions of dollars being spent by individuals and companies to fly up. And so we're going to be able to do it in these bodies. And our, our celestial bodies are going to be tremendous when you think about it. So, verse 21 again. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street, there it is again, not streets, but street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass, and no temple. Well, why would there be a temple? Don't need a temple. We come to the house of God to worship the Lord, but there he will be. Won't need a temple, won't need a tabernacle, because the Lord will be there. And how wonderful and marvelous that's going to be when the Lord is with us. And uh, I'm looking for that. I wanted to see it, verse 2, or verse 3. Look back at verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Obviously, I'm putting emphasis on that, emphasis on it. And they should be his people, and God himself should be with them, and then as I introduced this before, and be our eyes. but notice he should be with them, their God. So we're gonna see the Lord and the glory and the splendor. We're gonna see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, he'll still have the nail prints in his hands and in his side and in his feet. And uh, so it's gonna be glorious. And I saw no temple, back to verse 22. I saw no temple though, and for the Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun. Now think about this. No need of the sun. The sun, of course, we know is a star. And the moon, of course, reflects the star. So tonight when you look up at the moon, if it's a full moon or tomorrow afternoon, you look up and see the moon, and uh, that'll be uh, our new Jerusalem will be a little bit larger than the moon, and we'll be living there neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof. How very precious. Uh, so we won't need a power source. We don't need a power company and uh, we won't have to worry about paying our, our light bills because uh, the presence of the Lord will be there. Now here it is, verse 14 through 27. And the nations of them which are saved She'll walk in the light of it. So if you're going to worship the Lord, where are you going to go? You're going to go to New Jerusalem. And every year on earth, we'll have the Feast of Tabernacle. And every year, we will, for, in the millennium, we will come to the Jerusalem and we'll, of course, worship the Lord. And uh, we'll be living up there. The, the church will be living there. But we'll be coming here every year for the Feast of Tabernacles and worship the Lord. And the nations of them which are saved, these are folks that will be saved, of course, during the tribulation, the Gentiles and Jews, walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it should not be shut at all by day, for there should be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations 
into it. And there should no wise enter in anything that the fa no sin, sin is gone. Satan is gone. Deception is gone. Lies are gone. Ungodliness is gone. We will have our glorified bodies. No sin. No demon to tempt you. No bad thoughts. Nothing bad. All glorious. How wonderful that's going to be. How Satan has duped and destroyed and deceived so many people's lives. And even God's people, unfortunately. And there shall no wise enter in anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh the abomination or maketh a lie. But this is so very, very, very precious. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. How precious the Lamb's book of life. Look at verse 1 of the next chapter. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, notice again, singular, not plural. And on the other side of the river was there the tree of life. Remember back in Genesis, the tree of life was guarded by seraphims. And that seraphims had a flaming sword. Why? So that Adam and Eve didn't get back into the garden with their sinful bodies. And the river of life and the tree of life and which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. And there, and there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. His name shall be in their forehead. Father, we do pray now that you will as you've given us a foretaste, just a little taste tonight. Unimaginable how glorious it's going to be. Spectacular doesn't really coin the word to describe a spectacular vision, a spectacular sight. But Lord, it's going to be magnificent because our monarch will be there. Our Messiah will be there. And Lord, how glorious it's going to be. So help us tonight to keep on keeping on, to be faithful, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that our labors are not in vain in the Lord. And Lord, how pleasant and how precious heaven is going to be and yet and yet we still have that lingering burden upon our hearts of those who don't know you of those who are lost of those who have not yet had their names written on the lamb's book of life so help us to be faithful to pass out devotionals as we have opportunity help us to be faithful to speak as you give us opportunity, as Peter said, to be ready always. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. When you have control of our heart, when our whole heart is filled with thee and your will is working in our lives, then every occasion and every opportunity that we have will not be pressured to, to preach the gospel, to encourage people about you, it'll just be natural. And we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. He's our witnessing partner. He is our prayer partner. He's our Bible study partner. He takes the truth of your word and makes it real in our lives. And so Lord, tonight I pray that you've given to each of us a little bit of a foretaste of how magnificent it's going to be. Not just heaven, of course, going to be wonderful, but that you're going to be there. That we're going to see our Savior, the one who gave his life for us in all the eons and ages to come. 
every time we come in and out, we'll remember his redemption and the price that he paid to purchase our redemption, the pearl of great price. So Lord, encourage us tonight to encourage others. Help us to have a restful evening. Help us tomorrow as you, and if you tarry your coming tomorrow, help us to be available, to be a vessel, meet for the master's use. And we'll thank you with heads bowed and eyes closed. May we reflect a little bit tonight. Because the Bible says in chapter 22 that you'll wipe away all tears. Why would there be tears in heaven? There'll be tears in heaven at the great white judgment throne. And those who may be in our lifetimes we could have or should have witnessed to and did not may point an accusatory finger towards us and say, you could have kept me from this faith. So Lord, help us to be mindful, to always be ready to give an answer. And then Lord, help us to live clean and pure lives and holy lives. May the Bible be our book, not just Wednesdays and Sundays, but every day of the week. May we meditate on your word and grow in the grace. And Lord, may you enlarge our hearts to receive all that you have for us so that we can share you with others. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Good night. Thank you for coming.